Hello and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly, Director of Advanced Media Production at Cal State Long Beach. Our discussion today involves sustainable design and green building construction. My guest is Steve Glenn. Steve is the CEO of Living Homes. Living Homes is a California-based company that designs and builds sustainable houses. Welcome, Steve, and thank you for joining us on Talking Points. Thank you for having me. Well, we found out about you at the university um, here a few years ago when you won some awards for design and construction. We'll talk more about that in a moment. I know you also taught some courses or some seminars in green building and sustainable design here at the university. But to start the conversation, we should probably frame the subject for the audience. When we talk about sustainable design and um, green building, what exactly is that? In a nutshell, briefly, please define that for us. Well, sustainable design is designing a building in a way that really reduces its ecological footprint. So um, in general, we're talking about things that make the building more energy efficient, uh, water efficient, resource efficient. Oftentimes, uh, air quality gets lopped into that too. That's really a health issue, but um, some would say that um, uh, you can define sustainability to also talk, or at least refer to um, life sustainability. So those are the major issues that tend to get um, uh, 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 addressed in a sustainable design agenda. And when you talk about air quality, we're talking many times about indoor air quality. Right. And how that's affected by what are referred to as volatile orga organic compounds or VOCs. What are those VOCs? Well, that's one of the compounds. Okay. Um, it, it, it's indoor air quality defined broadly, anything that can pollute indoor air. Uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds, are compounds that get emitted from paints and stains. Uh, you also have uh, compounds like formaldehyde and urea. You find them in uh, the adhesives in carpet or millwork. Um, and then there's mold. And all of these um, compounds have been associated with more and more research. Uh, uh, more and more research has found associations between these compounds and skin irritation, eye irritation, head irritation, even forms of cancer. So it's uh, bad stuff that really has no place in, in an indoor environment. So green building means that it's not only environmentally friendly in terms of the overall environment, it's also human friendly in terms of those things that you just mentioned. Exactly. All right, well, let's talk about your motivation for getting involved in sustainable design and green building. What was the motivating factor for you to get involved in this area? Well, really kind of the bigger area for me is, is architecture, is design, is the built environment. And as a kid, I just, I always loved architecture. I, I wanted to be an architect. I had books on Frank Lloyd Wright. I had Legos, I had blocks. Um, I would make cities and draw buildings. Um, by the time I got to college, I was also interested in technology, which is where I spent my career until I started this company. Uh, but I still thought I might go into design, and I did a, a, a summer program uh, where I discovered that I really had neither the talent nor temperament to be an architect, unfortunately. But I learned about developers, and, and one developer in particular, a developer named Jim Rouse, and he helped me to appreciate that, first of all, if you care about the nature of the built environment, uh, developers are more important than architects because they set the agenda. They actually control what gets built or not. So I concluded I should become a developer someday because A, I didn't have talent to be a, a good architect in my own opinion. B, um, developers are more important. And, and C, I concluded the world could use more responsible developers like Rao. So that, that's kind of the background. And after a couple decades in tech, when I hunkered down to focus on real estate, I just concluded that there was a large and growing number of people variously called the cultural creatives. I'm one who we really value design, health, and sustainability in the products we buy. So, you know, we're driving, I drive a, a, a Volt, but some are driving Priuses, and we're shopping at Whole Foods, or buying organic from Costco, we're reading Dwell and Wired, we're uh, buying uh, uh, organic uh, apparel from Patagonia, um, uh, we're using Apple products, we're buying from Ikea or design within we reach. So as I just indicated, there are lots of companies that 
offer products that have great form functionality and that are built in a healthy and sustainable way. But the production home builders, the KB Homes and Ars Pulte, Centex is the world, don't build for those people. So I said, I'm going to start a company to do that, to build for the cultural creative. And so it's about lifestyle. When you design and build these homes, it's always about lifestyle and, and the kind of lifestyle that people want to live in those sustainable homes. And that being the case, uh, there is an organization known as LEAD, which is Leadership for Energy and Environmental Design, which awards certification to various projects. And you happen to win the Platinum Award for a house you designed called the RK1 in 2006. Platinum is the highest award they offer. Why did they give your design, your home, the RK1, or excuse me, the RK1 home, why did they give it the Platinum Award and what did they say to you when they gave you that award? Um, well, first of all, LEAD is not the organization. The organization is the United States Green Building Council. That's a nonprofit. They started the LEAD program. LEAD is the actual certification program, uh, point-based. So you get points for things that reduce your energy use or water use or better indoor air quality or less uh, uh, resources from a carbon standpoint, uh, less waste. Um, and based on those points, you can get certified silver or gold or platinum. Our first home, which is my home, which I did not design, it was designed by Ray Cappy, one of our architects for Living Homes, um, was the first home ever to achieve platinum, actually. And we've done, we, we've had 13 of our homes certified platinum, which is more than almost any other design uh, firm in the country. Um, and for us, it's important because we think that our the people we're targeting, the consumers we're targeting, they care very deeply about the health, about the sustainability of their products, particularly their homes. And they want an objective third party to be able to verify that you are doing what you say you're going to do. Um, so that's why we like getting certified. That's why I think it's very important that LEED exists, that it is literally certified tens of thousands of buildings across the country. Um, and um, we are doing things um, at a very comprehensive level with respect to our environmental program. And it's important for people to be able to understand what we do vis-a-vis -vis others, and LEED does that. One of the things that you're doing is utilizing prefabrication in the uh, assembling of these homes. And why do you use prefabrication and what are the benefits of it? So we're using it to more efficiently build what we build. Um, first of all, first in, our, our, our homes are modern homes. They, they, they reflect a, um, kind of a warm modernism that frankly is, is more complicated to do than a traditional home, a faux Tudor or Mediterranean or a or a, a ranch, uh, homes like you might find from a production home builder. Um, so it requires a unique set of skills to do it. And then because of our environmental program, we tend to be using materials, finishes, fixtures um, that are also um, not so common uh, to uh, a, a typical uh, a home, typical developers. So it's important um, for us to work with factories where we can better control the production process, A. B, um, they tend to be much more efficient at building than site-based contractors. Typical uh, uh, site-based construction process, first you have to do the foundation and all the site work. And then, and only then, can you frame it and do plumbing and electrical. With prefab, as you're working on the site, we're working off-site on the home. So we're able to build in a third or half the time. We're dealing with labor that is uh, nine to five folks who work at the factory, not a bunch of subs who can be flaky and not show up at times. So it's more dependable, it's faster, and it's lower cost because it's built in lower, um, in areas where the uh, cost of living is less. So for all those reasons and much less construction waste, we like prefab. All right, well, we actually have a video of the process of coming up with the design and the construction and the assembly of that home. So let's take a look at that video right now, which we're seeing on the screen. This is called The First Living Home. Tell us about it, Steve. Uh, well, the, the, so we're, we're seeing renderings of the home um, before it was built, again, designed by Ray Cappy, um, incredible architect. Uh, uh, he started Cyarch. There's Ray. There he is, Ray. Um, and uh, 
Uh, this now is uh, are showing some pictures of the site, site work being done, uh, framing of the modules. They were built um, about 45 minutes from Santa Monica, the sites in Santa Monica. That's the cistern they just showed mm -hmm. uh, being installed, so that captures rainwater. Um, now some pictures of the modules off-site, so kind of showing in parallel both the foundation work and the mod work happening at the factory. That's the radiant floor. Um, the home was assembled on site just to make sure things fit together. Mm -hmm. And now this is a video, obviously time lapse, of the um, actual installation of the home. It was uh, eight, eight and a half hours, uh, um, the process. So um, we went from um, the home um, uh, site and then eight and a half hours later, the home was 80% done. Um, so uh, kitchen mods in, the bathroom mods in. Now they're working um, to finish the first floor. The second floor just came in, one of the, uh, actually master bedroom, my bedroom. Uh, second bedroom, now third bedroom. Uh, and then the decks came in and the trellises. And again, that whole process was about eight and a half hours. Okay, and uh, so it's a pretty impressive uh, process when you can get all those folks together and put something like this uh, from start to finish in eight hours. Of course, you had to build the foundation exactly, for that. Exactly, right. And what about in terms of when you uh, have the home completely built, you were starting to talk about electrical and plumbing and so forth. Do you, does it take more time to set up the plumbing and the electrical and so on after the assembly is done? No, that comes in the mods. That comes in the mods. Yeah, now, and, and this one um, was not nearly as complete as, as we do it now. The, the windows weren't there, the millwork wasn't there, but um, when we bring in mods now, and I think we're showing one later, it has all the finished plumbing and electrical, windows, millwork, even the appliances installed. And so that's the house after it's built, obviously, and right. uh, it was... in today. in today, and it was ready to go as soon as we had it assembled. Well, no. No, it took three months to finish it okay, out. Okay, sorry. But, but um, very quickly after, uh, um, after the mods are assembled. Okay, so we put the house together, we've got it, uh, we're ready to go, and a little more time to get everything into move-in condition, but uh, obviously this was an effort that uh, was well worth it when you see at the end of that eight-hour day, um, wow, the house is really coming together. Yeah. What's the feeling like when you see something like that happen? Yeah, it's just, it's pretty, pretty dramatic. I mean, you know, you, you usually have to see things like that with special effects in movies. I mean, um, a neighbor came home, he had a doesn't live there anymore, but he had a job, left very early, and he came back and I saw him just with his mouth agape, he just, because there was a whole home, and when he had left, there was just a sight work, so, yeah, it's dramatic. It is. What are some of the possible pitfalls in this kind of uh, construction? Are there some things you need to look out for in the process? Um, I mean, you can't, uh, it doesn't work for every site. Um, if you can't transport the mods there because of tight turns, narrow roads, if you don't have the necessary clearances for a crane because of trees or power lines that you can't move, you can't do it. Um, uh, it's hard to, to change things once production starts. I mean, we work with factories who will take two weeks to, at this point, to build the modules. So. Um, if you want to rethink things along the way, that's, that's difficult, but um, there aren't a lot of pitfalls that we're aware of, um, uh, it's, it's, but, but it's not for every kind of construction project. Right. So the, it's the, good for what it is. The things it does, it does very well. On that note, we're going to have to go to the break, so stay with us. When we come back, we'll take a look at some more videos and have more discussion about sustainable design and green building. Stay tuned. Make a difference in our future by researching and helping to preserve our natural resources. The wide variety of careers in this field will have a huge impact on our lives while using the principles of engineering, chemistry, and biology to help find solutions to environmental problems. 
you could be a part of this exciting field with a degree from Cal State Long Beach. Welcome back to Talking Points. I'm Dave Kelly. My guest today is Steve Glenn. He's the CEO of Living Homes. And Steve, uh, before we went to the break, we were talking about the fact that uh, there aren't very many problems involved in this. Uh, the only thing that you cautioned is that people need to know what they're going to do before they get involved in the manufacturing prefab process because it's hard to change, change things once that starts. But uh, let's talk about cost because people are going to be concerned about cost and anything of this type. What are the costs um, for this kind of construction that you do versus a normal, quote unquote, traditional house construction? Well, so we've got two lines, a higher end line, the Ray Cappy, and then a more moderate price. And we used to bid out our projects both to a site GC and the factories, but the factories were always less cost. So, and, and, but, but it's probably important to mention that we've been, we generally work in higher cost building environments. In other words, we're doing projects in Santa Monica, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Diego, uh, uh, Napa, uh, San Francisco. Um, it's expensive to build projects in these cities. We haven't yet done one, for example, in um, Riverside or in Hemet. Um, it's less expensive to build in those environments. So what we found is in the environments that we've been working in, we're 10 to 30 percent less than than site-based contractors than the bids we received at least to do those homes. Okay, so so it is competitive. It's actually quite competitive. Yeah, and then half to everything. a third of the time. Right. And in terms of sustainable materials, are we talking about using materials that are more environmentally friendly? Are we talking about recycled materials, those sorts of things? Yeah, I mean, but and again, it depends on the category. I mean, on the energy side, more energy efficient lighting like LEDs, light emitting diodes that use a tenth of the power of it than incandescent. On the water side, um, more uh, water efficient uh, uh, water fixtures. Uh, with respect to building materials, we tend to use um, as much as possible recycled materials. We use steel a lot. Steel is the most recycled building material. We use wood um, uh, uh, when we can that is uh, Forest Stewardship Council certified wood, so they certify that wood is grown and harvested in a sustainable way. So we try to source responsibly, but it doesn't mean everything is recycled or reclaimed. That, that, that That's not... Um, realistic because we also have to trade certain performance requirements and cost. Okay. All right. Well, Steve, your operation does things the right way and you're very efficient and you get things done in short order. But there are some ways where things can go wrong and not your company, but we know from uh, a 1920 film made by Buster Keaton, things can go awry. So we have that clip now. We're going to take a look at it. Let me set it up for you. Um, Buster Keaton uh, plays the role of a bridegroom, newlywed couple got a gift of a build-it-yourself home kit. And let's take a look at the film and see what happens. You're supposed to be able to build this house in one week if you follow the instructions. There's the newlywed couple. They found out that they've got the portable house kit. They're ready to go. The next day, Buster is doing the sawing. His wife is uh, preparing breakfast. and eagerly anticipating the new home. Breakfast is ready, as you can see. She calls him down, and Buster says, I'll be down in just a moment here. So he's gonna work away, but it looks like there might be trouble coming up here. As you can see, the way he's, oh boy, there it is. So there goes Buster, and uh, the wife is obviously concerned. She goes to help him. Uh, he's okay. The next day, you see the framing wall is already up. Buster's got the hammer, he's ready to go. He's building that framing wall, tightening thing. Oh no, what's going on there? Oh boy. So now Buster doesn't know what happened to us. Where'd she go? He's looking for the wife. Uh, so he's desperately calling out to her, trying to find her. Oh, there goes the wall. Okay, so the next thing, Buster's putting on the uh, kitchen basin there. That's the, the kitchen sink. He's nailing it on. Why is it on the outside of the house? Well, actually it's a spin around device. I'm not sure if that's the right way to do it. Here he comes with the chimney, trying to put the chimney stack on. Maybe that's not the way to do this. Looks like trouble might be coming here. I, oh boy, there it is. Okay. 
So with that, he's got the house built, but a strong wind storm comes up, wind and rain, and uh-oh, he's trying to keep it from, oh, that foundation wasn't very solid to begin with, but look at that. It's kind of reminiscent of the Wizard of Oz tornado scene, which happens 19 years later in cinema. So there we see the couple after the storm. They turn around to see what has become of their house. It's a little bit devastating, but uh, that's an example of how things can go wrong if you don't do it the right way. So just a little comedy relief, uh, Steve. So as we look at that, um, you know, build-it-yourself kind of designs have been around for a long time. That's uh, dated from 1920. But what you're doing today uses all the technology, all the resources, all the modern methods of construction. And have you been really satisfied with everything you're able to do? Are there some things you could do differently that you'd like to do better in the future? Tell us about that. Well, I mean, you're always trying to improve, and, and we have learned a trim, tremendous amount. I mean, I, the building a home is um, uh, never incredibly easy. Uh, there are, uh, particularly in the areas we work, because we tend to deal with cities that are very strict in terms of uh, inspections in terms of requirements before you can even start building with respect to your plans and so it takes time and um, the process is not nearly as efficient as frankly it would be if it were private enterprise in my opinion um, so uh, it takes it takes time and and there are challenges along the way that that aren't always based on um, predictable rational agents um, so uh, uh, I, I guess I'm sharing that there are many things you can do to get better at what you're doing, but with specific uh, respect to the government agencies that have that very much impact your project, they're hard to predict and they absolutely impact how long it takes to do what we do. So um, that I don't I, 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 that'll always be there, and um, and 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 that's always a challenge. Well, we know that you've actually been able to reduce the assembly time from the eight or eight and a half hours that we saw in the first clip to another project that you did not too long ago where the assembly was down to three and a half hours, and that's pretty impressive. So let's take a look at that video, which we've got up there right now. Here it is. Tell us about it, Steve. Um, so this is a uh, four-unit project, um, actually in Santa Monica. Um, it's the second version of a home we built that was designed by uh, Kieran Timberlake. The first one we actually introduced at the TED conference and then um, uh, it ultimately was sold and installed in Newport Beach. Uh, it became the first lead platinum home in Newport Beach. Um, so um, because this is only four modules, uh, super efficient to install, the modules came with all finished plumbing and electrical, with the um, appliances actually installed in the module, all windows. Um, and yeah, I think this was three or three and a half hours to do this. Um, so um, that's, for, for smaller homes with not lots of mods, that's all we need. And then um, we can finish them out within a month, um, uh, w w w which, really shows the great advantage of this kind of process versus site. I mean, to be able to build and complete a home um, in Los Angeles in less than six months, three to four months, that's, that's impossible. Right. I mean, and normally you'd count on 12, 18 months. Right. So when we look at something like that, we realize what the possibilities are. Right. And so uh, connecting that to your previous answer, basically if we can reduce the bureaucratic aspect of this and, and government inspection and so on, if that can be reduced, really the sky's exactly. the limit here. Yeah, so we've gotten super efficient in the production, but no more efficient than anybody can be at getting things permitted. And sometimes that takes, we, we've definitely had permitting processes that have taken far longer than the actual production or construction of the home. Well, let's talk about being able to use this type of design for other kinds of construction, like multi-unit family housing and apartments and that type of thing. Do you see this being able to um, be utilized for that kind of construction? 
Yeah, we've done a couple of multifamily, small one, seven units in San Francisco, first lead platinum multifamily in, in, in Northern California, and then a three unit in Silicon Valley, first lead platinum sil uh, in Silicon Valley. But um, there, are, there are groups that are doing hundreds of units um, using prefab to, to do those units. Um, so that's happening. Um, we're um, in discussions on a few multifamily projects and, and we think it offers great potential. How far away are we from becoming a society that uses this as the majority of construction as opposed to something that's uh, unusual? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm not I, enough of an industry expert to, and, and not that even the industry experts would know. I mean, I will say this. In Japan, in Germany, in Scandinavia, the majority of homes that are built are prefabricated. Now, those countries have much more expensive labor rates, so that's an issue, and shorter build seasons because they're colder. Um, we have cheap labor, and certainly in many parts of the country, you can build year-round. At what point the, the tipping point gets tipped, um, I don't know, I'm, 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 but, but, but um, it's definitely the case that there is more and more modular production happening. Um, however, um, it's definitely still less expensive for the big production companies to build on site. But really what they do is bring factories to the site. I mean, when KB Home or Lennar or Pulte does a big project, with hundreds of homes. They have teams of framers and electricians and, and plumbers who go from site to site. So it's like they're taking a factory um, to each of the sites. So I think it'll be, I'm not sure that will ever change. I mean, again, I, labor rates would have to go up way high or much higher than they are now for that to change. But I think more and more infill projects, which tend to be smaller, which tend to be much more expensive, more and more of those projects will be done with prefab. And on that note, we have to come to a close in this program. It's really flown by, but I want to appreciate you being here and sharing this with us today. It was great. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Talking Points. Join us again soon for the next episode. Until then, I'm Dave Kelly. Have a nice day.